So in order to begin the proceedings, let me first admit one sort of uh, reality. Uh, that yes, this is the launch of the High Court book, uh, but it's actually in print at the moment. So you should receive it in a, in a couple of weeks, and uh, you can then get Mansoor's sign on it. <laughs> so we just thought that this was a very good occasion to actually officially launch it uh, pre-publication, uh, so that we can have a good discussion and a robust sort of uh, thought process should be generated out of, out, out of this. The book shall be available in most bookstores in two weeks' time, so please do get a copy and uh, do go through it, and I hope you will enjoy it. So my task, uh, before I ask the speakers to come up, is to explain the idea behind the book and also go through its uh, contents so that you can get an idea of what this, this is about and why it was compiled in this manner. Uh, the idea behind the High Court book is not simply to give a narrative uh, of uh, what happened in the High Court in the last 150 years. Uh, if we had just done that, it would have been pretty boring actually. This judgment took place. Uh, a narrative of course has its bene benefits, but it also has its drawbacks. So it is not just a simple narration of this, it is also a reflection of what has happened and why it has happened. We, want to, we, we wanted to understand how the idea of the rule of law developed, for example, in the, in the Punjab, how people responded to the idea of rule of law, and how it has developed over the ages. I'll give you a very interesting example. Uh, I was talking to an anthro anthropologist a couple of months ago, and she gave me this very interesting uh, uh, local ballet, uh, which I have incorporated in the book, uh, which roughly translates to that these two women were fighting in, uh, in their village. And uh, one of the women said, said to the other one that, you know, in earlier times, I would ask my men to take revenge on, on this, but now I will take you to the court. So, you know, this is how much it had seeped in, the idea of uh, the court kacheri, so to speak, as we, as we talk about it. So this is very interesting from a moment where you would settle score yourselves to now the idea that litigation, the idea that you would go to a, to a judge to get, um, um, to get just, justice, that, I, that conception, that idea of the rule of law uh, has seeped in the mindset of the people of the Punjab in the last 150 years. Another very interesting uh, theme uh, which came up during the research was the fact that the, that, that the Punjab had the highest percentage of lit litigation in all of British India. Uh, it had more litigation than the rest of British India combined, which is, you know, these huge presidencies of Bombay, Calcutta, Madras, the United Provinces, Central Provinces, uh, all these areas combined, uh, the Punjab had more uh, uh, had had more litig litigation, which meant that either there were you know too many cases and too many bad things happening in the Punjab, or as I argue in the book, that the conception of the rule of law had actually seeped into the psyche of the people. And even if someone did something wrong, they still wanted the court to justify it. Um, and you know that would bring us to to recent history. But you know if you can infer from the fact that even if the rulers of the day want to do anything wrong, they still want an imprimatur from the court, and they still go to the court, which I link to this idea that somehow the court is seen as this validating factor. So as long as the court has said it is fine, it is fine. So I think that is a, is a very interesting conception that has developed through the last 150 years of the Lahore High Court. Another very interesting aspect, I think, which has come up is the fact that the idea of justice in the last 150 years has moved from a person-based system to a system based on a statute book, on a rule book. So it is not that you have Kazi X or Kazi Y or King X or King Y that he is uh, administering justice or actually dispensing justice. Uh, it is the courts. And there is a very interesting section in the book where we, where we talk about the, the, the fact that why did, you know, uh, in previous years and actually even now, at least in the Supreme Court on ceremonial occasions, why did judges wear wigs? The judges wore wigs because that equalized everyone. A judge is not there on the bench in his personal capacity. He is there to apply the law. And it could be judge whoever. And that doesn't make a difference. So 
from a person-based judiciary, a person-based system of justice, the Lahore High Court was instrumental in moving it towards a system-based justice uh, system, uh, a procedure-based thing, uh, something that followed the statute book and not the whims of a personality. And in a country, uh, in an area of South Asia where this had never happened, this was really pioneering. A lot of people, uh, and there were very interesting in in instances that a lot of people came up to the, to the judges and said, but you are a judge, you can do this. And the judge would respond and say, no, I can't because it's not in the rules. This is not a law. I cannot break the law. And people would get very shocked about, shocked about this. So that's a dramatic social change that the high court brought in amongst the people of the, of the Punjab. So therefore, it had great effect on the way we thought, in the way we acted, in the way social relations took place, and in the way society developed. Uh, before just going through, uh, finally, the, the chapters, uh, the last thing that I really want to want to men mention is that the Lahore High Court uh, has also a lot of great honors, lots of peculiar honors also. So one of the great honors was that it was the first high court that had a, a local person, a local South Asian, as a chief justice. Justice uh, uh, Sir Shadi Lal became the chief justice of the Lahore High Court in 19. Uh, 20 and continued for over a decade. So that's a singular honor that the first Indian to become a Chief Justice was from the Lahore High Court. We also have the singular honor that the first Muslim Chief Chief Justice of the Lahore High Court was Sir Abdul Rashid, and I see his great 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 grandson here, and his and his and his family here, and he of course had the singular honor of administering the oath to the Qaid Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah, and uh, there is a story about him. I, I'm not sure how true it is, uh, but uh, it is said that uh, when Sir Abdul Rashid was about to administer the oath to Jinnah, uh, Jinnah came a bit early and sat on his chair, and Sir Abdul Rashid went up to him and said, can you please not sit on this chair? I have not made you Governor General as yet. And Sir Abdul Rashid, I must say, uh, I have spent a lot of time sort of uh, trying to dig things out of him, uh, but I do want to just narrate this bit that his instructions to his brother judges were very interesting, and he even forbade them from attending weddings, uh, which I hope is, if becomes the rule now, saves you, will save you a lot of time and energy. <laughs> Uh, but, he, but he said, you know, in, in one of his instructions, he actually said, if you really have to go to a, a wedding, or if it is a relative or something, uh, please go beforehand to their house and congratulate them. You should not be seen in public. So very interesting idea about how judges acted and what did they think about uh, the stature of a high court judge and uh, the high standards that they maintained and still maintain. Uh, I must say, uh, that again uh, puts it in a class apart uh, as compared to other institutions in the country. So with that slightly long preface, uh, let me just narrate to you the six chapters that we have in the book. The first chapter is about the beginning of the court. We have begun it from the end of the Sikh era so that you can get an idea of how the Sikhs used to, used to deal with justice. And of course, if you've read about Maharaja Ranjit Singh, and I hope um, Izazuddin Saab will actually talk about about this, it was a big change from how Ranjit Singh, uh, Ranjit Singh's reign and the Sikh era looked at the idea of justice. So the first chapter looks at that. The second chapter looks at the period uh, of the chief court from 1866 to 1919, when the Lahore High Court was not a full high court, uh, but in most of, of, the of the jurisdiction and the rights of the high court, and how it actually administered not just an area of the Punjab now, it administered an area from the Afghan border to Delhi, from Kashmir to the borders of Sin, so a huge land, land, land mass. The third chapter looks at the high court period between 1919 and partition, 1947. And here again, the Lahore High Court had the singular privilege that not only did its jurisdiction extend over a large part of India, it also had extraterritorial jurisdiction over British, British subjects in uh, Chinese Xinjiang. So CPEC actually began very early, perhaps. Uh, we already had a big say in what was happening in Xinjiang at that time. The fourth chapter looks at the post-independence period from 1947 onwards up till uh, 
2016 and looks at the development of the court and its place in society in the post-independent Pakistan era. The fifth chapter, which has been authored by, uh, Saad, by, by Saad Rasul, looks at the relationship between the bar and the, and the bench over the ages. The Lahore High Court Bar Association traces itself to over 100 years and how that has developed and nurtured uh, and, the, and the ups and downs of the, um, of, of the relationship. And the, and the last chapter has been authored uh, by the Honorable Chief Justice of the Law, High Court, Sayyid Mansoor Ali Shah, looking towards the future. And I think that's a very important chapter because, yes, we have traced the history of it, but now we are looking at where it is going in the future, where it should go, where actually Mansoor for the last two years has leading it, uh, and what his hopes and aspirations are, where the judiciary will lead. So hopefully uh, you shall have a very good treat. Uh, we, we, have, we have a lot of uh, pictures. From, from the archive, from Lahore, from L London, from elsewhere, from the families of a lot of judges. And therefore, it shall be a very good uh, book to, to read. So I would highly recommend it, and I hope all of you will buy it. Um, and I'm not getting any money out of it, so in case, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so don't worry. Uh, so now I would like to ask uh, Mr. F.S. Ijazuddin to please come up and uh, give his presentation. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Chief Justice Mansoor Ali Shah Saab, other eminent guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Bangish for his invitation to be here, but particularly um, the Chief Justice. Because while I was in Karachi, actually I was in Mohindradaro, and I received the summons from the Chief Justice asking me to be present this afternoon. One cannot knowingly refuse a summons like that. <laughs> it's a request, but that's your graciousness, sir. I regarded it as an order, and that is why I'm here. I mention this because um, I really have no credentials to be here beyond the fact that I live in the Punjab, I honor the laws of the Punjab, and therefore, it's important for us as citizens of our country to be able to pay tribute to one of the pillars of state. Dr. Bernadette has mentioned that um, Ranjit Singh had a particularly individual style of governance, of law and order. He, um, it is said, apocryphally, that he used to receive arzis and he would put them into two piles. And then he would say, ye manzoor, wo na manzoor. And that was how law was, was, uh, justice was administered. It wasn't quite as simple as that, because there was an effective system of uh, justice. In 1849, of course, when the British took over, the, there was the introduction of British laws married to local laws. And in its heyday, the British government, uh, British Empire, they governed 23% of the world's population. It had countless colonies, and most of them have matured into independent countries. We in Pakistan have yet to come out of that colonial mindset. We still suffer from what is known as the Stockholm Syndrome. We're still in love with those who held us captive for centuries. Let me analyze our patrimony. Mohammed bin Qasim was not a native Sindhi from Bambor or from Tata, and yet his Muslim beliefs became ours. We adore the Mughals, even though they were essentially and originally Turco-Mongol Turco invaders with Persian connections, a dynasty of foreigners who ruled us for over 350 years. The British governed us for 100 years, yet we recall their patriarchal administration of us with nostalgia. We speak in English, our laws are now, including our constitution, are in English, we still sit for the Cambridge ONA level exams rather than develop a national curriculum. And our ultimate status symbol for some is property in London. I say this not to denigrate nor the, con the contribution made by each stream in our national DNA, whether it was Arab, Mughal, or British, but merely to explain it. There is a tendency amongst hardcore nationalists to disown our colonial heritage I'm not one of them. If it had not been for them, 
I might still have been making clay pots in Harappa and living in a mud, mud hut made from sun-dried bricks. I am what I am, partly, if not mainly, because of my inheritance. And that is why I see our beloved city of Lahore not as the debris left behind by colonialists, but as a precious inheritance worthy of respect and care. The aggregation of public buildings you see from the Lahore Fort to Sharmag Bar are not the residue of empires. They're less stone scepters of power than surviving symbols of service. The Bachai Masjid was not built by Aurangzeb for his private use. After all, the, mosque, the size of the mosque could accommodate 50,000 Aurangzebs. The Shalmar Gardens alternated over the centuries Shalmar Gardens alternated over the centuries between being a royal garden and a public space. Similarly, the complex, the buildings, complex of buildings between the Secretariat and Aitchison College on what used to be the Mall were uh, erected not to assuage imperial vanity, but for public benefit. Take the buildings constructed during those fertile decades in the 1880s. The first Punjab Assembly Building, now the Punjab Secretariat, the Town Hall, the Museum, the GPO, PWD offices, the Lahore Cathedral, the new Assembly Building of Charing Cross, now Faisal Square, the adaptation of the tomb of Qasim Khan into Governor's House, Lawrence Hall, Montgomery Hall, and Aitchison College. They were built to fulfill a public function. The Punjab High Court Building was one such jewel in this imperial circlet of civil service. The statue of, Henry Lord, of Lord John Lawrence that once stood at the Fane Road Junction at the corner of the present Punjab High Court bore a rhetorical question by him. Will you be ruled by the pen or by the sword? He could not, have been, he could not be blamed for not foreseeing that in due course, Pakistan would be ruled alternately by both the pen and the sword. If law and order are deemed to be synonymous, then no building personifies this happy union more than our present High Court building. At another level, this building is an architectural forerunner of what we know today as glocalization, which is the adaptation to local conditions. The adaptation in the case of the, uh, this uh, being architectural became known as the hybrid, hybrid Indo-Saracenic style. And this style borrowed brazenly from local and foreign traditions. For example, please, it borrowed its inspiration for its fluted minarets from, among others, the Kutub Minar in Delhi. It took the crowning cupolas from those of the Taj Mahal and similarly distinctive monuments, Mughal monuments. Slipped into the final design were hints of a Buddhist stupa. Ornamented arches with marble latticework inspired by the Alhambra in Spain and wooden balconies for which Lahore's old city was famous. Of all Punjab, the Punjab High Court's features, the main entrance, go, okay. The main entrance is the most striking. It drew upon Moorish motifs and adapted them to a Punjabi brick facade. One idiosyncrasy of the architect Brassington was that no chipping of any of the bricks was to be allowed. Every ornamental feature was fired separately. And the final effect was the unity of the whole should transcend the sum of its constituent parts. The Punjab High Court at the epicenter, okay, at the epicenter of this architectural confection is the heart of any High Court, the Court of the Honorable Chief Justice. And here is law in all its majesty. And just in case the Honorable Chief Justice might forget, sorry, back, the design of his table lamp on the left is molded, is modeled on the scales of justice. The Punjab High Court, sorry, go back. The Punjab High Court has seen more history than I can describe here. It is the crucible from which pours that precious gold ingot called justice. 10 years after it was constructed in 1881, 
A young imperialist, Rudyard Kipling, revisited Lahore, the city he called his home. Passing Tiksadi Gate, he addressed this remonstrance to Lahoris. The Lahore municipality has sold the Tiksadi Gate for brickwork, leaving an ugly scar on the city wall. Gentlemen, you have done a sin, for that gate was built like the pyramids. It had little beauty except for age and time. You could have bought bricks from any potter, but you will never build another Taksadi gate. And that is why we revere the Punjab High Court building, not because it is unique, not because it is irreplaceable. We treasure it because it still stands, but more importantly, for what it stands for, the dispensation of law, and justice and the renewed assertion every day of human dignity. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Ijazuddin Saab, for that uh, marvelous trip through history uh, and also explaining the importance of the building itself, uh, which is full of symbolism and uh, imp important reflection. Uh, now I would ask Ambassador Saad Rasool to please come and uh, deliver his talk. Um, it's a pleasure being here. Thank you very much for inviting me, Dr. Bangash, um, Honorable Chief Justice, Honorable Senior Puni Judge, uh, members of the judiciary and guests. Uh, sadly, or, or, or not so much, I don't, I don't have as much of a prepared uh, speech on my paper for the simple reason that my paper reflects on, and particularly in this, regard, in, in this book, it speaks about the overall history of the bar and the bench, and then tries to project uh, how the relationship would work out in the future if the, if the system of justice is to survive in this country. A trip down dates and, and names would probably be a lot less, uh, would, be, would be fine as far as reading the paper is concerned, but a lot less interactive when it comes to a speech. So you'd forgive me for being a little more extempo and speaking more generally about the relationship of the bar and the bench. Um, and I also request that, um, that, some of the, that some of the observations made be excused from, um, for, for, from being contemptuous in, in, in the presence of judges. <laughs> Um, the paper, uh, when I was asked to write this paper, I was very honored, Dr. Bangash was very kind to ask me to write this paper, and the Honorable Chief Justice uh, was very encouraging in this regard. Um, just by way of putting this in context, prior to making certain observations about the bar and the bench both today, a little bit about the history, and more importantly, how it should work in the future, um, let, let's sort of come back to the idea, let's sort of first revisit the idea that the legal profession is not a profession that came about when black coats started being sewn by, 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 by people around the subcontinent. That's not when the legal profession came about. The first lawyers, if you trace the history, especially in common law tradition, if you trace the history of when the legal profession came about, you'd have to go back to approximately the, the year 1272 and the reign of Edward I. That's when formally a person whose issue was before a court of some sort hired somebody else to come and speak on their behalf and represent their case. So the profession that the lawyers represent today is somewhere around 800 years old in the common law tradition, and still we're struggling, sir, to figure out how best to, uh, to go about it on a, on a daily basis. In Lahore alone, in Punjab alone, we'd have to go back to 1860, and it's somewhat ironic that the Lahore High Court bar, the genesis of the Lahore High Court bar, uh, which, which dates back somewhere around the 1860s and 1870s, starts from, a, starts from an event when, uh, when a lawyer, who was not really a lawyer at the time, was a pleader in the subcontinent, got into a scuffle with, the honorable, with a member of the honorable bench. As a result, the then members of the Honorable Lahore High Court or the Punjab uh, High Court requested, passed a resolution, passed a physical resolution requesting one of the senior lawyers to convene all the other lawyers and figure out what's the best way to go forward. So it's ironic almost that the bar associations came about um, when one of the lawyers decided to, to, to get into a tussle with the, with the bench itself. And for this reason, uh, for this very reason, the bar associations were created. But uh, leaving aside the, the, the precise dates, names, and histories, let's sort of all agree at least on the fact, 
whether or not we agree with the politics of the bar today, the jurisprudence of the bench today, the interaction between the bar and the bench today, let's at least agree on the fact that this bar boasts tremendous tradition when it comes to personalities that have worn the black coat in this country. I mean, just to name a few, we'd have to, of course, start with Qadi Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah and Ilama, and Ilama Iqbal and others. But even post-independence, individuals such as Manzoor Qadir Saab and Abid Zizan Manto Saab and, and several others um, would put the best legal minds in the world to shame when it comes to legal practice. And that's the tradition that the next generation of lawyers in this country, especially in Punjab and in Lahore, for example, in, in Lahore High Court, would have to carry forward. Unfortunately, uh, I believe, and it's my observation, despite being a lawyer, that we're failing that tradition, that we're not doing the best that we should have been doing in upholding the tradition of, uh, of, of Iqbal and the tradition of Qaid and the tradition of many others. But let's sort of splitting this between the bench and the bar. If a few things could be, uh, if a few things could be observed, and again, I've sought permission, sir, um, that this would not be held in contempt in any way uh, if, a, if a few constructive observations are made, both in terms of the, uh, of the bench and the bar. Let's first talk a little bit about the bar. For those who are, a little bit, for those who are unfamiliar, I'm, I'm assuming that there are people in the audience who don't belong to the legal profession. For those who are unfamiliar, the bar associations and the legal profession in, in, in Punjab or at least let's say in Pakistan, is divided at three different tiers, formally divided at three different tiers. There's the district bars or the respective dif district bars. Then there's the provincial bar associations and the provincial bar council. And then at the, at, the, at the national level, there is the Supreme Court Bar Association and the Pakistan Bar Council. That's the formal structure within which the lawyers divide themselves, both in terms of the bar associations and the bar councils uh, and, and regulate the profession. Um, Unfortunately, there's been, a, there's been a tremendous deal of tussle both between district bar associations and provincial bar associations and inter se vertically between district bars and provincial bars and provincial bars and the federal bar from time to time. And recent examples which we can't shy away from have occurred in southern Punjab. They've occurred even on the outskirts of Lahore. Bars that are at the district level as well as the provincial level have gotten into tussle both with the bench and between themselves. Different members of the bar have divided themselves into groups. Um, while they've done tremendous work in some aspects into, uh, by dividing themselves into the group, they've also, I believe, and I've noted so in the paper, uh, done some harm to this profession. They've, they've, divan, they've, they've brought some division in this profession. If we all choose that instead of belonging to the constitution that we are sworn to defend, instead of belonging to, the, to this profession that is larger than any one of us, that is larger than our lifetimes, that is larger than the number of people sitting in this, in this hall, or for that matter, the number of people who this profession governs at this particular point in time, this profession, which has been there for about 800 years in a formal, uh, in some form of formal capacity, it, it was here before, before we got here, it'll be here certainly much after we're gone. If you think about it in that perspective, is there any way for the bar, is there any reason for the bar to think about itself in individual groups, that I belong to the group of person A, that I belong to the group of person B, and that I will follow whatever instructions are issued by that person or that group alone. Is there any reason to do that? And the answer, no matter how entrenched we are in this profession, would have to be no. Would have to be no. The only allegiance that the black court should swear to is the allegiance of the Constitution. The only fidelity that we should have is to the fidelity of law. The only service that we should be a part of is the service of the people, not the service of any group, not the service of any individual, not the service of any particular electoral constituency that we're a part of. Because what are we going to do next? Form two lines and throw stones at one another. How is this, go this going to go forward? While speaking about this, sir, with your permission, let's also, let's also identify, and for now, I'm only speaking about the bar. With the uh, Honorable Chief Justice's permission, I will uh, make a few humble comments about the bench as well, but, um, but just about the bar first. Um, this is not how it always used to be. I'm, I'm very new to the profession. Um, just now an introduction was made um, about the credentials to speak about this topic. I certainly have no credentials to speak about the history of the bar in terms of my participation in that history. My credential to speak about it is only as a student who is a member of the bar, 
but also wants to see it grow as a profession in which I intend to, pers I intend to live the next however many years I am granted on this, on this earth. So while I don't have the credentials to speak about its history, I'm told by very, very senior and eminent lawyers that this is not how it always used to be. That 15, 20, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, within, within the recent lifespan, uh, this is not how the bars were distributed. That this division, this incisiveness in the bar culture started primarily about 10 to 12 years ago um, from a, from a, 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 in terms of a very important event in Pakistan's constitutional as well as national history, which was the lawyer's movement. The lawyer's movement has done tremendous good to this profession. It has done tremendous good to this profession. However, in the same breath, we would be belying ourselves, sir, if a few ideas which have, imp have seeped into our profession post-lawyer's movement, which we don't accept and therefore uh, rectify. Um, those, ideas relate to, those ideas relate to the divisiveness of the bar and the confrontation between members of the bar and members of the bench. A lot of that confrontation starting from, from, district, level, from district level bar associations who uh, overnight had, become, had, had reached national success in, during, the, during the course of the lawyers' movement, but senior members of the bar, it is, it is my observation, sir, and I've so noted in the paper, uh, senior members of the bar were responsible for sending the, the junior lawyers back home when the movement ended. It was their responsibility to diffuse this situation once the lawyers' movement ended. Now, the movement has been finished, वकीलों को बार काउंसिल्स में जाना चाहिए अदालतों में जाना चाहिए सड़कों पे नहीं लड़ना चाहिए ये ये रिस्पांसिबिलिटी मेंबर्स ऑफ द बार की थी एंड अनफॉर्चूनेटली ओवर द पास्ट 10 इयर्स दिस रिस्पांसिबिलिटी हैज नॉट बीन एडिक्वेटली डिस्चार्ज्ड बाय सीनियर मेंबर्स ऑफ द बार एंड दिस इज समथिंग दैट गोइंग फॉरवर्ड वन ऑफ द वन ऑफ द इश्यूज इन 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 दिस बुक इन दिस पेपर दैट वी हैव दैट आई हैव रिटन इज हाउ द फ्यूचर ऑफ द बार इन द बेंच विल बी one of, the in, one of the most important aspects of the future of the bar and the bench places responsibility on senior members of the bar, um, uh, senior members of the bar to be able to diffuse the situation. I'm being told that I'm run over time and I, and I apologize. I'll just make one or two small observations, sir. Uh, the, the issues being taken up by the bar in terms of technology, in case in, t in terms of technology and case management infusions are very important, but sir, this, the, uh, and since, the, since um, uh, Justice Shiawali Saab is also here, sir, the Honorable Lahore High Court will have to carry this forward for it to be, for it to be an institutionally entrenched um, idea, and this will be integral both in terms of the bars, uh, both in terms of the bench's own performance, of course, which, the, which nobody else judges but the public, but the relationship between the bar and the bench, and we hope that this tradition will be continued. Um, we are entrusted, both, both lawyers and judges, I say this with tremendous humility, we are entrusted with the enormous, enormous, enormously impossible obligation of fulfilling a divine idea of justice, of adl. None of us should have the pomposity or the arrogance to say that we are able to do it fully, that we are able to even do it adequately. But to reach some higher fraction of that other than we are at present, to, to, to reach some higher fraction of it tomorrow than we have today, and, and each day some higher fraction of it is the only endeavor that the lawyers and the judges should be, should be uh, involving in. So we seek your guidance in it, and we hope that the bar councils and their respective members will also uh, participate in an equal measure. Thank you very much for inviting me. I hope that you enjoy the book. Thank you very much Saad, for your comments and uh, I am glad to know that you, are, you, have, you have been saved from contempt by, by, by speaking here and getting the, the permission of the Chief Justice. Uh, now I would like to invite the Senior Puny Judge of the High, High, High Court, Mr. Justice Yawar Ali, to please come up and share his thoughts with us. The Constitution, Constitution of Islamic Republic of Pakistan, 1973, is based on the principle of trichotomy of power, executive, legislature, and judiciary. And when it comes to judiciary, I can safely say that out of all the constitutional courts in the country, it is Lahore High Court Lahore, which is the largest in terms of the litigation, in terms of the decisions that we render.
this court lahore high court has seen some stalwarts there have been people like justice a r cornelius justice m r kiani justice mudar rahman who have rendered judgments which are one would i would like to call them as an intellectual masterpiece these are judgments which we and can read again and again and again and sometimes when i stand underneath a banyan tree which is located in lahore high court and i believe sir it's about 134 years old i think of all these intellectual giants of the judgments they've given the good that they've done for society a lot has been said about the institution of high court they have about the building and so on and so forth and some of the things you will also uh, read in the forthcoming book but let me tell you some interesting anecdotes some interesting events which happened some interesting stories just to make this thing a little more interesting once a lawyer a lawyer of great eminence was asked by a chief justice much before partition to come on the bench and to become a judge and he declined at a time when you know it was considered to be very very prestigious and the chief justice asked him i said why have you declined he said sir only for one reason i can speak nonsense for hours but i cannot hear nonsense for more than half a minute <laughs> similarly justice m r kiani is very famous for some for a few sentences which he used to utter background being that there was no building of the august supreme court of pakistan at that time and they wherever they would come to wherever they were holding court they would hold court in the lahore high court building so if you were staring down a petition and in way and in vain a lawyer would say my lord there is a recent judgment of the august supreme court of pakistan and the judgment that you are delivering would militate against that judgment he said okay no problem you can go to the borrowed wing <laughs> so there have been some very interesting argument and I, there's another thing which is a story which is told about uh, pre-partition uh, judges and lawyers that there was a, a lawyer who was very short stature and he was a leading lawyer of his time and he was pitched against another lawyer who was very very tall they got into an argument till the lawyer who was very tall lost his temper and said mr so and so i would pick you up and put you in my pocket if i want to <laughs> and the short stature gentleman lawyer answered in that case there would be more brains in your pocket than in your head <laughs> <laughs> so these are some of the interesting anecdotes that i had heard that i thought i'll share with you and i would not like to now keep my honorable chief justice to come and say a few words <laughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Well, I had no idea that uh, there will be so many people here. You know, it's not uh, Hanif Qureshi's book, or it's not Mohsen Hamid, or it's not Asha Jalal and Minto, but it's a boring book on the history of the High Court. I thought there won't be people here, but I'm so glad that there is audience, and I'm so glad that you're all here. Uh, just uh, as a background, uh, we've never had a book on the history of High Court except what uh, Justice Sidwa, long years ago, came up with a compilation of some notifications, a little background, but principally on the history of the bar of the Lahore High Court. So we thought it might be important to talk about the High Court and, uh, you know, sort of document its history, as well as the history of its building, the history of its bar. And so it's important because everybody sitting here and sooner or later goes to courts, and especially you must have gone to the High Court and the way High Court delivers justice, uh, I thought it was necessary that we document all this, especially our building and especially the history that we have. And I'm so thankful to Dr. Bangash, who I got in touch with earlier, and how we thought how to do it. We're not historians ourselves, and we sort of all bogged down with work. So I'm just thinking, how do we do Dr. Bangash, uh, I met, and uh, we thought we can put it together. So very kind to Dr. Bangtosh, thank you so much that you, you, you were the force behind it and you really worked very hard to put it all together. 
And then we thought uh, how to capture the history of the architecture that we have. I mean, it's beautiful, as you see, and I'll just comment on it as how I see it in a bit, which might not be historically or architecturally correct, but I look at it as a, as a judge, and it means a lot to me. Uh, so we reached out to uh, uh, FS Fakir Hussain Saab, or uh, we requested him, Ijazdeen Saab, to, to help us with this. I think he's uh, one of the best minds we have who can read buildings. And uh, Kamil Saab, Kamil Mutaz Saab was also there with us to look into this, you know, the building of the Lahore High Court as well as some of his benches. And uh, thank you to Fakir Jazuddin Saab as well as Kamil Mutaz Saab for putting a chapter together for the book. Then we thought it would be incomplete uh, if we don't cover the bar, you see. So uh, we reached out to Sadr Rasool, and you've just heard him. He's put a wonderful chapter together on, on the history of the bar and some of the future developments that we need to see. I've also tried to uh, put a chapter together on how we look at the court and how it will go, the, uh, how it should be in the future, and what kind of um, thought process goes in, the way we run our courts, we also try to capture how we operationally work, what are our issues, because a lot of people don't know this. So the basic idea in putting the book together was to sort of showcase what we do behind those walls, you see. Pata to chale aapko ke high court mein kya hota hai, high court kaise chalta hai, high court ki history kya hai, aap log aate hain roz, apne cases bhi dekhte hain, attend karte hain, and I think it works as a shield, you see. I, that's how I look at the courts and I look at the high court in particular. That it does act as a protective shield, protects the weak against the powerful, and protects people, the citizens, against the excesses of the government. There could be ups and downs, there could be good and bad judgments, but I tell you, justice gets done at the end of the day. And I tell you, if you will take up just 2017 as the year, we might, according to the figures given, there are more than 200,000 cases filed at the Lahore High Court and about 97% of those cases have been decided. So we do decide cases. Lekin I tell you if, you, if you look at the entire data and you look at the cases that we do, we do, justice does get uh, uh, you know, delivered at the end of the day and a lot of people get justice and the figures speak for themselves. I just want to share a little bit of history now that some of them are here. And by the time, I don't know, uh, Dr. Bangash said that the book is going to be out in two weeks. I think that's a bit ambitious. And I, as the Chief Justice, can't make such a commitment. I think it might take a little longer, but it'll come out soon. So I thought I'll just share with you a little bit. And I'll just take not more than five minutes to explain to you what we are It might be. You know, it's not a mainstream topic, but I thought thoda sa aapke saath share karna chare. High court, a constitutional court hai jo constitution ne banaya hai, so it's, it has, it was established way back in 1866. And I'll just uh, sort of comment on its history in a bit. But jo currently, current position hai humare high court ki, we have a principal seat, jise kehte hai, Lahore High Court. This beautiful building right across salt and pepper on the Mall Road is the Lahore High Court. And you really, you, I'm sure you've seen it. And we have uh, three benches. One is at Multan, the other is at Rawalpindi and Bhawalpur. And it's one of the five high courts that we have in the country. And uh, the high court actually means the chief justice and the judges of the high court. So if I were to go for a golf vacation to Thailand, there will be no high court unless we appoint an acting chief justice. So it's somehow the constitution recognizes the chief justice and the judges constitute the high court. We have 60 judges at the Lahore High Court, a court that started with two judges in 1866. So we, we deal with constitutional matters basically. You must be familiar with the word writ. Writ file ho rahi hai, writ file hoti hai. So that is a constitutional writ that you come to the court directly. It's our original jurisdiction. We also have appellate and other jurisdiction where appeals come from other courts, but primarily our most important uh, jurisdiction, which is constitutional and is there to protect the fundamental rights of an ordinary person, would be the constitutional jurisdiction under Article 199, which is our strongest point. Uh, our appointment of judges is now through a two-tiered collegiate system. That is through the Judicial Commission and through the Parliamentary Committee. We go through an extensive process 
an appointment process and make sure that you know we select the best of the best amongst the bar as well as from the district judiciary. Uh, the High Court also supervises, unlike the Supreme Court, the High Court also supervises under the Constitution the district judiciary. So Punjab being the largest province in that sense, population-wise, we have 36 districts. We have about 2,400 judges and uh, about a staff of 20,000 people that we administer from the High Court. So the, the High Court that you see has huge administrative functions regulating 36 district courts and about 88 tehsil courts in Punjab. So it has a huge canvas. We also have ex cadre courts, and that's by that I mean not the mainstream district courts, but like banking courts, consumer courts, and all sorts of other drug courts and labor courts. They also come under our ambit, and we also regulate them and their appointments and look at their progress. So that's the kind of focus we have. Uh, we also interact with about the bar, the size that you did not mention perhaps was about 88,000 bar members in Punjab. That's advocates who come to our courts and they are active. You see, even though perhaps the number crosses about 100,000, but the active members according to the records is about 88,000 lawyers who are actively uh, working through this system in Punjab, the justice system in Punjab. Uh, as I said, we were established in 1866, and we celebrated our 150th last year in 2016. Uh, our judicial working time is 9 to 2.30. We work for about five hours a day. But let me just also share with you, you see, the kind of pressures we have, because a lot of people are critical also that justice doesn't get done, and people I mean, of course, people say this, that the cases, generation guzar jati hai ji, mukadmo ke faisle nahi hote. I take that, uh, and I, we've tried to work very hard on that account, and I think that might be true in certain cases, but at the same time, justice does get delivered also and gets done. So if you look at it, you see, we have a population of 110 million in Punjab. Ye zara zaruri hai figure aap ke liye bhi. Ki 110 million hai population according to the provincial, uh, pro provisional census that's come out. So, 60 judges of the High Court. So one judge is actually catering to 1.8 million people. So, you know, have a heart, you see. We're trying to work pretty hard, but that's the kind of figures we're looking at. But if you look at my uh, district judiciary, uh, judge in the district judiciary, uh, one judge is catering to 62,000 people. So, once again, nowhere in the world would you have that kind of a ratio. Uh, if you want justice delivered the way you want it, theoretically speaking, you would probably require more than eight to 10,000 judges in Punjab in the district if you really want things moving, if you want to make it parallel with any other system outside in the world where you go and look at their cause list and you see about five, six cases fixed every day. You go to my judge's court and you see 150 cases fixed there. So, I mean, Fine, I, I take all the criticism and I think we need to fix things, but have a heart also, you see. That's not possible to forget that out. So that was just a comment to share with you some of the figures because a lot of people don't know this, that we work under very trying conditions. Uh, some of our, the district judiciary, if you look at their working conditions and some of our female judges who might, I see some of them sitting here, I, I salute them actually for the kind of work they're doing sitting out on the roadside. It's a roadside justice. There are frontline courts, and they're sitting out there, and uh, the conditions are not that appropriate, but they're still dispensing justice. And all sorts, it's a public court. Anybody can walk in, and anybody could, you know, sit through the court proceedings, and the way they're administering justice is amazing, I think. And, you know, just the figure last year for the district judiciary, we've decided about 22 lakh cases a year. That's not a bad figure. It deserves a clap for the district judiciary, at least. So this was just, I mean, I'm not winning sympathies here, but I'm just trying to tell you the reality that we need to have more judges, we need to structure things more, we're trying hard to do that, but that is just as a matter of background. The book doesn't deal with this. The book actually deals with the history. Uh, perhaps the second edition might deal with jurisprudence and could become slightly more analytical in that sense, 
but in the first phase, we thought we'll just capture the history and put it together for people to see and read, you see, so what's, what's the High Court is all about and how does the justice sector in Punjab function and what its background is. I think it'll be a wonderful read in that context and put together with the architecture and some of the wonderful trees that we have. The, 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 the oldest is about 147 year old, the banyan tree uh, is something that uh, you'd like to know. A lot of people who come to court don't really go into some of our areas which are for ex exclusively for judges. So I thought it might be interesting for uh, the notary resident of Lahore to know more about uh, the High Court. The format of the book is more of a coffee table book with a lot of photographs for you to see how this wonderful institution functions and how does it work. It was just a matter of uh, history for people who are here and I take advantage of, uh, of that and I want to just share that the story as far as the Lahore High Court is concerned begins in 1866 when we started off with just two judges, two judges and the first judge was Justice A. A. Roberts, and the other was Justice Charge Bolonor. And this was way back in 1866. And then it sort of moved on. I don't want to bother you with a lot of details, but uh, in 1884, it moved on to uh, five judges at that time. And Sir Henry uh, Plowden was then the chief judge of our court, you see. We used to call him chief judge of the chief court. So the whole, the literature was chief court and chief judge in 1884. And come 1990, when letters patent by George V was issued by, uh, under the Government of India Act 1935, and the chief court, in a way, got remodeled. The same court got remodeled and renamed as a high court on the 20th, 21st of March, 1990, 1919, we were called a high court in that sense. And we had our first chief justice then, who was Sir Justice Sir Henry Rattigan, who was there in 1917 till 1919. And then we moved on, and as rightly mentioned earlier, uh, one of our chief justice was Rai Bahadur Shadi Lal, who was the first ever Indian and the youngest chief justice of any high court in India at the time, you see. Then comes 1947, and you know, we take over. The first Muslim chief justice was Mr. Justice Sir Abdul Rashid, and I see their family here also. It's a proud moment in that sense. <laughs> And at that time, you see, we had 10 uh, uh, judges at the High Court, and some of them opted to leave for India, but we had two Christian judges and six Muslim judges at the time. Later on, Bahawalpur acceded to Pakistan uh, in 1954, and then sort of moved into our jurisdiction. And writ jurisdiction that we now have under 199 was conferred through an amendment in the India Act in 1930 five earlier than uh, before this court, sort of, uh, before independence. So in 1955, the Howard High Court was converted into the High Court of West Pakistan and had jurisdiction covering Karachi also, you see. That's how Lahore High Court was at that time. But things changed in 1973 when it was restricted to Punjab and the jurisdiction lay within the, uh, uh, the, the, the ambit of the province which was Punjab. But before that happened, before the partition, the Lahore High Court had jurisdiction all the way till Delhi. So if you see, the High Court of Punjab and Haryana is a successor court of Lahore High Court. Even if you were to go to Punjab and Haryana today, the High Court, they still cite judgments as precedents from the Lahore High Court because Lahore High Court is their mother court, and they still refer to that. And they have a wonderful museum in Chandigarh where they still have some memorabilia as far as the Lahore High Court is concerned. So we've had great stalwart judges also, Justice Shadeen, Justice Shadi Lal, Justice uh, Sayyid Abdul, uh, Abdul Rashid, Justice Cornelius, Justice uh, S.A. Rahman, Justice Muhammad Shabir, Justice Yaqub Ali, Justice B.S. Kakaouz, Justice M.R. Kiani, Justice Sardar Iqbal, Justice Naseem Hassan Shah, Justice Rustam Sidwa, Justice A.S. Salam, and the list goes on. Some great people who have dispensed some wonder and sort of delivered wonderful judgments. You see. So they're all sort of documented. We talk about these judges also in the, uh, in, in the book. 
There is a chapter on the architecture, which, of course, uh, uh, the experts have written, and they know more about it. But how I see the building, you see, if I could just have the building's photo in front. If you look at it sometimes, you see, I see a lot of religions being reflected. It's a hybrid architecture to my mind. And this is perhaps this is not architecturally correct, what I'm saying, but this is how I look at the building, and it means a lot to me. I see a lot there. I see a temple there, a cathedral there. I see a Muslim motif there. I see a truncated Qutb Minar there, as if all the religions come together at the, in the fountain of justice. And it does not matter. It does not matter to us what religions come to us. We have to deliver justice, you see, according to the Constitution. And that, I think, is very important in today's time and age, that the court is only about justice, nothing else. Nothing else matters to us. And we've been trying to do that. And I think the history reminds us, and the building reminds us every day, that, listen, we, all the religions come to us, and we're neutral on that account. We're just simply here to execute and you know, implement the Constitution and protect the fundamental rights of an ordinary person, period. Nothing else sort of crosses our mind. The other is, of course, the history of the High Court, which has been so elaborately discussed by uh, Mr. Sadr Sool. Uh, that is also documented. This also started way back in 1882, and the, 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 it mentions some of the presidents that we've had, some eminent lawyers who've come out. I mean, if you say Sir Muhammad Shafi, Sir Muhammad Zafarullah Khan, S.M. Zafar, Rabia Kari, Abid Sen Manto Saab, Mahmoud Kasuri, Jaz Batalvi, and the list goes on. Some of the wonderful uh, lawyers who've uh, sort of walked through the corridors at the High Court here. So that's a wonderful history and a very rich one. We will try to come up with the jurisprudence of our court, which is, I think, very rich in many ways. We have interfered in a number of things. And let me just briefly mention, which is mentioned in the book also, that over the years, the court has handed down judgments upholding fundamental constitutional values of democracy, freedom, equality, tolerance, social and economic political justice. Jurisprudence coming out of our court has interpreted the Constitution and progressively interpreted the fundamental rights. Reflection on the, we've interpreted right to life, right to mobility, right to travel, right to livelihood, right to clean environment, right to information, right to fair trial, gender rights, rights to dignity, right of differently able people, right of blind persons to employment, right of minorities relating to Christian marriages, right to environmental justice, and recently perhaps a state of the art, right to climate justice, which hasn't happened anywhere else. So I think we've done a pretty good job, you see, and I think you deserve a bigger clap than that one. So thank you so much. Uh, the book comes out in about, uh, I won't sort of put a time frame on it, but it comes out soon. I hope you get to enjoy it. Thank you so much for taking your time out and listening to us about our high court. Thank you, and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chief Justice Mansoor Ali Shah. Uh, I must say, uh, it, at least we have high hopes that it will come in the in in the in the time. It might be a day or two uh, longer, but we shall all try. Uh, as long as it's a good good book, um, time perhaps doesn't matter for that. Uh, again, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chief 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 Justice, for taking time out of your busy schedule, and especially on a Sunday. Uh, to actually come and launch this book. I also want to thank the senior puny judge, Mr. Justice Yawar Ali, for gracing the occasion, to Mr. F.S. Ijazuddin, and to Saad Rasool for being a part of the panel. And of course, most importantly, <clears throat> all of you present, present here, this has been a ter terrific turnout, not just of the legal fraternity and judges and honorable judges, but also of the general public. And I think, again, we have shown uh, that the aim of this festival, of this Think Fest, is to bring bridge gaps. So maybe that could be you know, one of our tag taglines, bridge bridging gaps. So again, we have brought uh, a very important topic, uh, one of the pillars of our society, the, the, the courts, uh, and brought them in interaction with academia. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you again, the, the panel, for being here, and have a good evening.